See if I say good evening now. That sounds better. Hope everybody is doing well. So glad you could make it for our Wednesday night Bible study. Brother Larry's going to come and lead us in a song here in just a moment. Brother David's going to be giving us the, the message of the minutes, so to speak. And uh, hope that you uh, are doing well. We've got a lot of announcements, so we'll get to those a little bit later. But thankful that you could be here tonight. Let's stand as we sing together. I will say to thee. Welcome to 2024. Uh, Dave got to uh, do that Sunday morning, and um, it's always good that we can think about new times. A new year can bring new hope for a brighter time in family and worship and school and careers, marriages. We give thanks to God for a new year to fill life with new hope. And Sunday, Dave also... uh, had included in his sermon a reminder about choices and decisions that we make in the coming year and how it could affect our lives. So when you're faced with major decisions this year, hope you make good, righteous ones when you come to a crossroads, and that's the subject for this minute tonight. Um, Not talking about the decision, what color shirt to wear tomorrow, where we're going to go eat tomorrow for lunch. As we go through life, we have all those simple everyday choices, but occasionally a big choice jumps up, requires a righteous yes or no, option A or B. Sometimes we don't know what to do. We look back in scripture, look at an example with, with King David. In 1 Samuel 23, when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. Shall I go and attack the Philistines? The Lord answer him, go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. And then in 2 Samuel 2, in the course of time, David inquired the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns in Judah? And he asked, the Lord said, go up. Which one? Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. In 1 Samuel 28, Saul asked God what he should do with the Philistines waging war against him. God had tuned out Saul, or Saul had tuned out God because of his sin, and he went to a witch instead. The answer was not what he wanted. So when we get into the New Testament, God guided directly through his spirit that he wanted uh, Stephen to go preach to the Ethiopian eunuch. He gave Paul a vision to instruct him to go to preach uh, in Macedonia rather than Bithynia. 
would it be nice that we could just make it that easy? But we do have the full word of God. We have been taught the principles that we need to know, if not direct commands, principles. So when we come to a blind intersection in life, something jumps up. When we're searching to find an answer, when we're facing a temptation, how do we know what God wants me to do? There's three things that I've learned in my life, and not, not just mine, I'm, probably most of you could, could come up with this. Some of the things that I've learned have been because of the wrong decision. The first one is often in difficult and complex situations, we don't know what we don't know, and that's dangerous. So because of that, the second thing is sometimes the right choices today, not even a yes or no or A and B, wait. Wait till tomorrow when the answer may come. And the third thing is a difficult or quick decision made without consultation and prayer has the greatest possibility of unintended consequences, and they can be devastating. Some of the questions that you might think, think of that comes up in, in life, saying yes or no, young people, to a, a marriage proposal or where to go to college, jobs, uh, staying in Memphis or taking a high-paying job in Dallas. Dallas is great. Do I forgive him or not? You fill in the blank. We go deep into debt or for something like a house. What do we do about an unfaithful spouse? These required decisions. Staying or leaving your congregation, you're here tonight, you're going to stay at Germantown. And finally, when the doctor asks, what do you want me to do now? And I know we've had that question asked many times for our older people. So, Three other things to remember that I've got. <clears throat> All decisions should be made with our Christian faith and our teaching the scriptures in mind. Just a few samples. These are principles and direct commands. <clears throat> Jesus said in Luke 18, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. In Romans 12, Paul said, don't repay evil, anyone evil for evil. Be careful what you do in the, that is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And again in Luke 6, Jesus said, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray with those, for those who mistreat you. Do to others what you would have them do to you. That's the first thing. Second thing, there's nothing that you will ever face that someone else hasn't faced before. Sit down and talk with someone about the problems. Either they're old or young, doesn't matter. Consult with an elder, a minister, a friend. And whenever you express those problems, be truthful. You have to be truthful. And what you say, say remains in private. Third, prayer and meditation. Sometimes this requires you to be on your knees with a friend or with a spouse. When two are together praying out loud, you're not going to lie to yourself or to God. You have to ask God for help. So if you need any help with anything tonight, or if you are not yet in God's saving grace, it's time to make that decision as we sing the song.
Thank you, gentlemen. David, thank you for just reminding us that we need each other. And we need God to lean upon. And as I go through a lot of these announcements, uh, there's a, a great time for us, of course, at the end is when we pray together. But there's always a time when we can reach out to the people around us, pray for them, and not just here. But I'm encouraging you to pray on your own time, when you arise, when you awake, and throughout the day. Um, so this one is just uh, new tonight. Uh, Jerry Asbell told me, or was telling us out in the foyer, he had to go in for something and he has thyroid cancer. And they don't know if it's contained or if it's spread. And uh, he's got a 9.30 appointment in the morning and we need to pray for our good brother. I'll just say this, they don't make them like they used to. So Jerry, we love you. Um, so just, there's a lot for us to be prayerful about. Mott Jones has been released from the hospital. He's now at the Jewish Rehab Center. Alice Petty is to have surgery on January the 16th. So praying for her and the surgical team attending to her. Um, I, we, we, we sent this out in an email this week. Stephanie Lee, that's the mother of Susan Vick. She fell and she had several broken bones. And I talked to Brad and he told me she will remain in the hospital until Friday. And then she will be moved to a rehab facility. Um, also, um, we, Sunday morning we announced, and this is the nephew of Sherry Walls, is Andrew Dunaway. And so the, the MRI came back and um, the, the cancer is benign in some places, but in the liver they're going to do a biopsy again tomorrow. So they're going to do a biopsy tomorrow to make sure they know there's cancer in the colon. And so surgery possibly next week, that's what it's looking like. And so, once again, that's the Andrew, that's a nephew of Ms. Sherry Walls. His name is Andrew Dunaway. He goes to the Madison Church of Christ there in Alabama. The Wings Heirloom Stitchers get together scheduled for Saturday, January 13th, 2 to 4 in the church library. You can contact Ms. Linda Edens for more details. Also, the Elder's Breakfast, don't forget, is the 27th of January, 8 o'clock. And you can sign up in your classes. You can also sign up out there in the foyer. But uh, as I've encouraged you before we go to our Bible classes and as we pray, let's continue to pray on our own uh, and when we wake, when we go to sleep and throughout the day, let's pray for one another. Let's bow together. Father, we're so thankful for an evening that you bring us together, uh, this time of midweek Bible study, this time of prayer meeting. And Father, we lift up so many to you. Father, we lift up Brother Jerry and we just pray that uh, that cancer is contained and pray that they can go in and, and just take care of whatever uh, that needs to be done on his behalf and just continue to pray for him. We pray for Mott Jones and uh, pray to him as, as he's now at the Jewish Rehab Center that you would just be with him and give him strength. Pray for Miss Alice Petty. She's having surgery on the 16th. Uh, just pray that that surgery can go well and it can be on time and on task. We pray for Stephanie Lee and just praying that she can heal up and as, as she is moved to a rehab facility that she can have a, a peaceful life. I know it's been a, it's been a hard time on her and her family. Uh, we pray for Andrew Dunaway. We pray for all the people that's taken care of him and is ministering to his needs. And Father, I just pray that cancer is gone. I pray that it is uh, away and gone from his body. And and whatever is there, I hope they can take it and I hope they can remove it. And it can be just. Uh, it's something that we all deal with. We have family members, we have friends, and we've all dealt with so many different venues of this life that, that throw us um, curveballs and things that we're not expecting. But Father, we are thankful that we have a, an awesome God, a powerful God, the great physician who can heal, and Father, who can minister and who can comfort. We're thankful for this midweek time to be together as we pray together and as we study your word. Father, as we draw closer together and closer to you and we draw strength and we need that strength. We need your guidance daily. We need your good word to soak up our lives. And Father, we need to be salt and light in this world. And Father, we need to love each other. And Father, it's the easiest thing in the world to do to say I love you. But Father, sometimes we need to show it a little bit more. Father, help us to love each other. Help us to pray for one another. Help us to just reach out and do the little small everyday things that we can do to make this life upon this earth better and peaceable. But Father, help us to be faithful. Father, help us to enrich our lives with your word. Father, help us to be moved by your spirit so that we can be the light of this world. Thank you for loving us and we're thankful for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.
How are we doing, Austin? That's good. <laughs> we got it now. Uh, thank you very much for being here tonight. Richard Hastings is going to come up and lead us in prayer. Uh, before we really get into the lesson, but I wanted to welcome you and also anyone who may be uh, with us online this evening. Um, we have it on some authority that Bob and Joy Straw may be with us tonight, so uh, we're happy to hear that and hope they're doing well. Um, Richard, come on up, Will. Pray with me, please. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for this opportunity that we've got to gather this tonight and study from your word, Lord. We'd ask you to be with Larry as he brings us a lesson, and we ask that you open our minds and hearts and we can all take something out of the lesson that will help us live more in accordance with your will. Lord, we'd ask you to be with those that are sick and need your help and be with those that have lost loved ones and, and help comfort them. And Lord, we ask you to be with people in Ukraine and in Israel as they continue to battle for their very existence, Lord. Especially be with the Malugas as they do continue to do your work there. We just ask you to be with us, watch over us, and we ask you to forgive us when we fall short, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Those of you who've been in the class, and even if you've not been, over the last several weeks, uh, Dave Phillips has been uh, doing a series on um, who we are uh, as the Church of Christ or the Churches of Christ. And uh, one of the basic uh, things, some of the basic things that we do, such as a cappella music, other things, um, different roles of people, uh, those kinds of things, where we get authority, what, what we recognize as authority. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at a topic that we um, a little bit, I guess, skipped over just a little bit in the list as we got into the end of the year. And uh, that topic uh, really is one that you're so familiar with and we're all familiar with, but sometimes it's good for us to go back and revisit it. And, and that is really the Lord's Supper. I apologize if this is a little difficult for you to, to read. Hopefully it's not awful. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to look at tonight is the pattern and practice of the church with regard to the Lord's Supper. What is it that we do that is different? What is it that we uh, uh, sort of hold on to uh, as something basic for, for our body, for the body of the Christ that, that where we meet. Uh, one of those things that we look at is we, we typically say that um, it is acknowledged by all of us really that the Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus himself and that's scripturally supported and we know those particular verses that we We'll look at it a little bit tonight. And we hear those on a regular basis, don't we? We hear we, even this uh, past Sunday on second service, uh, Sam Bush was uh, uh, leading the communion service. He used 1 Corinthians 11, and that's one that's frequently used. Uh, we also are noted within our brotherhood for weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. Um, that's something that I, I, we don't take for granted, I don't think, but it's some, it, it does not square up necessarily with what other religious groups might be doing. So why do we do that? Uh, another thing we do is we tend to embrace, or do embrace, uh, the central element, Lord's Supper as a central element of the worship services. And we think of the other elements of the worship service. We think of prayer, we think of proclamation or preaching, we think of singing, we think of giving, all of those things, but typically in our brotherhood, we, we really venerate that period of time when we focus upon the Lord's Supper. And one thing that I think is interesting is we, are, we tend to be characterized in our, in our church uh, groups as uh, putting on a very simple observance not very ceremonial, a lot of simplicity within the, in the way we do that. And so we're going to look at a couple of things tonight to, 
to sort of see where some of this comes from. The first point about the Lord's Supper, but as far as our brotherhood is concerned, and the fact that we acknowledge that he himself instituted the Lord's Supper, uh, we have these scriptures uh, to look at and see this very clearly. Uh, on the night of his betrayal, uh, Jesus instituted the supper, and he did so as part of what? The Passover, uh, or at least a Passover meal. There's a little bit of, uh, I guess, historical dispute about was it really the Passover? It was Passover week. Were there more than two Passover meals that week and all that sort of thing? But in, in the scripture pretty much tells us that he was celebrating and observing the Passover, that he wanted to do that. And during that meal, uh, he shared uh, this little uh, part of it, which we now know as the Lord's Supper. I said here is a very solemn and poignant moment within that Passover. Um, you know, the Jewish Passover is interesting. It's a, it's a meal marked by uh, some celebratory observations. Uh, there are usually four cups of wine involved. Uh, most say and most think, most scholars I think, think that Jesus probably uh, was at the, about the third cup level of the Passover when he opened up this new procedure or this new practice. And he did it in a very simple way. Not long ago, uh, a friend of mine said something along these lines. He said, you know, when we start going at length during the Lord's Supper, sometimes we start missing the mark. We start getting away from the basic things that Jesus himself said you know, Jesus didn't use that many words when he did this supper. And we're going to look at some of those tonight. He said, you know, we tend to sometimes go a little bit over the limit in that. Um, I wanted us to think about that as we, as we go forward here. But the actions that Jesus was engaging in in the Passover meal were very familiar to both him and his disciples. They were totally acquainted with the rituals, uh, the observances, everything that took place. And so there were no surprises to them as he went through the, the Passover meal. But then he came to this moment and he did something new. He gave with the same elements, he put new meaning into them. And so I think that's an interesting part of this. Uh, Paul, of course, in 1 Corinthians, wrote that Jesus, he had received the, the information. We're not quite sure how he received it. Did he receive it by revelation or did he receive it in some other way, maybe from the other apostles? But somehow he knew and he recounts exactly what was said in the Passover. Let's look at, let's look at this uh, first uh, instance here in Matthew, Matthew 26, verse 26. And this is a, the setting here involves Judas, who would be his betrayer. And it's pretty clear in Matthew's account that Judas is taking uh, the emblems, or is taking the food, taking the, the, the wine as the, goes goes through this whole process of the Passover. He's right there with them. There's a little bit of uh, dispute about that in terms of what jo I think John's account, people have read into it that maybe Judas had gone before the supper. But in Matthew, at least, it appears that he is still there in verse 25. He's asking a question. But notice in verse 26 of Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Now we weren't there, but we can sort of imagine that that came as a, quite a surprise to the disciples. 
Again, they were very familiar with the Passover. They knew what to expect, when it was going to happen. But then this happens. Jesus said, this is my body. Then he took the cup in verse 27. He gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. If you look at the accounts in Mark and Luke, they're almost identical uh, to what Matthew has, what we have recorded here from Matthew. There's not much variation. It's very, very similar. So that's pretty much acknowledged that uh, there's, not a, there's not a great deal of difference in any of the gospel accounts, but it is important, I think, to note that these, these synoptic gospels really elevated this supper, and wanted to be sure. Think about who wrote these. Matthew, Mark, probably reflecting most of Peter's recollection. Luke, again, probably having done his research and reflecting uh, Peter as well as others perhaps, they really wanted to get this account right. And notice how simple it is. So it's a very familiar action, action when Jesus did this, but he did endow it with new meaning. He gave completely new meaning to it because he introduces the new covenant in his blood. If you look at 1 Corinthians, we'll look at that very quickly because that's such a familiar one. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Uh, again, we tend to hear this one a lot because this is so appropriate uh, by those, when those who preside over the Lord's table. Typically, many times at least, will use this scripture. And notice how Paul introduces it. This is in verse 23 of the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Now, he's dealing with a big problem in the church at Corinth. People are getting things mixed up. Their, their observances of the Lord's Supper are spilling over into all kinds of different areas in terms of the meals that they have, that sort of thing. And he's trying to correct that situation. So that's why Paul is bringing this up. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, and your Bible may have red letters, mine does, because he gives the quote from Jesus here, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. That's important to think about his desire that they would remember him. Now, who are these people who, are, who he wants to remember? They are the closest people on earth to Jesus. The, the 12 men 13 of them in all had been together for three years plus. Very close. They knew each other very well. And when, the, when things had come to this point on the very night of his betrayal, he's telling these people, who of all people we would think would remember him, to remember him. And then Paul, as he, as he relates this uh, passage, he's really telling the church at Corinth and therefore, all of us, when you observe this, remember him. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this is, this is a little bit of a change here. This is Paul's instruction here. What you are doing when you're observing the Lord's Supper is you are reflecting upon and talking about and proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And we're going to see what that, what that really means in just a moment. Um, we said earlier it's 
pretty obvious that we typically take the Lord's Supper weekly. Um, that is something not every religious group does, not every uh, group that would be identified as a Protestant uh, religious group. They don't necessarily do this. Why, why do we do it? What is it that compels us to do this or why we think we should do this? Uh, the scriptures in Acts, in chapter 2, verse 42, really give us some insight, but also uh, in Acts 20 and verse 7. And these really, I believe, and Jim, you can correct me and anybody else, I think this is where we really draw this conclusion that we should observe it on a weekly basis. It's really based on Acts 20, verse 7. And then the idea that the early Christians desired to break bread. Scholars have looked at this and said there, there's two distinctions here. There's a, a distinction between a meal, which was a fellowship meal typically, and the breaking of bread, which involved the Lord's Supper. And most of those scholars tend to agree that these two particular verses are referring to the Lord's Supper being observed. Uh, the, the other thing that I thought was interesting in just looking at this in, in Acts 2 and verse 42 is that not only did they devote themselves to the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper, observing the Lord's Supper, but they also were devoted to what? The apostles' teaching or the doctrine uh, to fellowship, very important, elevated idea of fellowship among the early Christians, very significant, very important, and to prayer, but certainly dedicated to the breaking of bread. And then Acts 20, verse 7, you'll all remember this one was when Paul, uh, I think he preaches till midnight, uh, but the Christians get together on the first day of the week and they, they want to observe the Lord's Supper or the breaking of bread at that time. And it was obvious that they were intent upon doing that. It was very important to them to do this. And uh, it happened that Paul was there uh, in that setting. The next element here I want to look at is the fact that the Lord's Supper is really embraced as a central element. Yeah, Joseph. Joseph, yeah, Joseph's question is, did the, uh, since the early church observed it, and, and as we believe and, and read uh, on a weekly basis, how did it happen that people moved away from that practice later on? Uh, and I think we're going to get into some of that. I think it has to do with men's enhancement on some levels, at least in, in terms of their opinion of what they should do and, and uh, expanding the Lord's Supper into a, a more ceremonial thing. Uh, I think that's where that sort of goes. But I wanted to give you this quote from Everett Ferguson here about the idea of the Lord's Supper being a central element of the worship service. Uh, and he says here, both theologically and socio sociologically, the Lord's Supper was the central act of the weekly assemblies of the early church. These were meetings to take the Lord's Supper, and he talks about these meetings in 1 Corinthians. Um, and these occurred on the first day of the week, again, Acts 20, verse 7. And I thought this was interesting. The Lord's Supper is expressive of the central values of the Christian faith and of what the church is all about. That comes from his uh, book, The Church of Christ, A Biblical Ecclesiology for Today, and my version is 1996. There may even be something later. But uh, I didn't know Dr. Ferguson, but my wife did. She had a class at Evelyn Christian. Uh, he said, she said he was a really tough teacher too, right? <laughs> and, uh, but this is a great book. If, you, if you've not seen this book or you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to, I think we have it in the library, but I really encourage you to get it because it is really, really valuable in terms of getting a sort of a quick view of doctrinal positions of the churches of Christ. 
over the generations, really, and how those doc those positions, how we look at things, how we how we see things, and and he really has done a, a beautiful job, I think, there, uh, in in sort of doing not not we wouldn't say a scholarly tome, but a book that gives a very practical view of how to uh, approach these issues. And I wanted to look at his. Again, I hope you can see some of that at least. Um, some of the aspects of the Lord's Supper as that he relates to the doctrine of the church. Um, and I think these are interesting because he's using some terminology here that may or may not be familiar to us, but we've, we've come across it in different ways. But he's, he's using, he says, these are, these are aspects to be considered about the Lord's Supper. One of those is that is thanksgiving. The Lord's Supper involves thanksgiving or Eucharist, which means thanksgiving in Greek. And you've heard that term, the Eucharist, or just the Eucharist. And that, that term has been applied broadly to mean the Lord's Supper itself but maybe it didn't start out to actually mean the entirety of the Lord's Supper. Maybe it was just the Thanksgiving part. And he said that what, what happens here when the prayer is given for the bread and the cup and it's Thanksgiving typically for that, what's, big, what's going on here is it has to do with the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what we're being thankful for in this uh, observance. The Lord's Supper as a term itself is a reminder that Jesus instituted it and it's his supper. I think that's an interesting way to look at it, the aspect of the Lord's Supper that is exclusively his. Interesting. But that's one of the aspects of the Lord's Supper that for us to, to, to really keep in mind. Communion or koinea uh, the Greek for fellowship. Uh, again, fellowship was emphasized in the early church. Congregational fellowship, brothers and sisters together in fellowship, a very important feature of the church. And he said here, when you go, when we have the Lord's Supper, there's a, a little bit different type of fellowship. The type of fellowship we have is a sharing in Christ's sacrifice and its benefits, and we actually identify in that process with his life and death. So we are really participating in this process. You know, we think about it, we're, we're actually identifying with his life and death ourselves. And in that sense, we are fellowshipping with our fellow Christians. We're together in this, observing it together. The other, uh, another aspect is memorial, or that Greek word, amnesis. Uh, by participating in this, we do what Jesus did. We do exactly the same thing he did. So we are remembering what he did, what he said about what he was doing, and we're remembering his death and we're bringing that into our consciousness as a present happening. In other words, we're bringing it forward to the present by going through the process of the Lord's Supper. A um, couple more here he has. And this one I thought, again, this is to me an interesting way to look at it. The anticipation of the Messianic banquet. Uh, and this goes back to 1 Corinthians 11, proclaiming his death until he comes. That's a future time, isn't it? That's a future event that's going to happen. So we bring the past event, his death, his resurrection, into the present, but also bring it forward to a future event when we think about until he comes. So it really is indicating, and this again, Dr. Ferguson is talking about anticipating a future fuller fellowship with the Lord. 
Um, he, he talks about the covenant meal, the aspect of the covenant meal. Uh, the sacrifice of Christ brought a new covenant based on forgiveness of sins. And Matthew 26, 28, he talks about this, the forgiveness, the covenant associated with that. The church, I thought this was an interesting statement, the church is the people of the new covenant and when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we're sharing in an act of renewing that covenant with that allegiance to the Lord. So it's a very, when we say it's simple, it may be simple in the way we typically do it, but it's so profound in so many different ways and the different aspects. He talks about the sacrament from the Latin or the mysterious, uh, mysterion or mystery from the Greek. Uh, and he's, he's really not talking uh, at the sacrament in the way we typically hear people talk about that. He, he sort of says it's more to him, um, one way to look at it is a visible sign of invisible reality. The tokens, the emblems that are used, doing what Jesus did, thinking back to when he did it, why he did it, thinking about how those who are sharing with us in that observance are all together in that. We're seeing something visible, but it, the invisible reality is also present uh, in, in, this, in this whole thing. Um, I wanted to get to this before we maybe have a time for some questions about this. And again, talking about relative simplicity of observance. Um, that's typically what we do. We were very simple, but we're in contrast to a lot of religious groups. Certain terms that are used by other groups, we don't tend to use. Um, Eucharist, that term is used by some to mean the supper itself, the Lord's Supper itself. Um, but if you go and, and you explore the definition of that, it's considered by uh, a sacrament of Holy Communion. Well, it can also be referred to as the sacrifice of the Mass. And sometimes Eucharist is even uh, applied to the consecrated elements of the Holy Communion, especially the bread. So I'm giving you some sort of dictionary kind of, uh, uh, I guess, definition of how that term is used. But a lot of times you will hear it, the Eucharist, and people will say, oh, you mean the Lord's Supper, exactly the Lord's Supper, rather than a part necessarily, maybe a part of the Lord's Supper, maybe the Thanksgiving part of the Lord's Supper. What is Mass? Mass can be defined as the celebration of the Eucharist. Uh, some of you probably have had uh, opportunities to observe a Mass. Uh, perhaps it may have been at a wedding, maybe it had been a funeral, or maybe it had been any sort of uh, different types of situations that you may have been there. And you know, there's usually, there's what's called a high Mass and there's a low Mass. <laughs> Um, so when uh, certain religious groups use that terminology, that the high mass typically refers to a mass celebrated according to the complete rite in which a liturgy is sung and not said by the celebrant and music and incense tend to be involved. Joseph said, when do you get asked the question, when did the church move away from a weekly observance of the Lord's Supper basically the same way Jesus did observed it and I think over time the answer is somewhere in that that man decided I need to dress this up a little bit I can think of ways to enhance this and the ceremonial things sort of came into the picture and people began to almost emulate the practices in the Jewish temple Think about that incense and music used in, in a celebratory way over, over the Lord's Supper. It's, it's something that sounds, if you were, have been in the church for a long time, it's, it sounds a little bit foreign now 
to us to think about that, but it's, it's almost understandable that man will do things sometimes to, um, in his opinion, make things bigger and better. Interestingly, low mass means a mass that is not sung, but said. Uh, it's less ceremonial, and usually there's just one server to help the efficient uh, and the low mass. What's liturgy? Liturgy is part of the, the way people develop forms of public worship. And it typically involves some type of collection of these forms uh, and could refer to a particular form of, or type of the Eucharist service. In other words, if you, if you pick up a book, some books like the Episcopal or Anglican Book of Common Prayer, you'll find that there are a multitude of liturgical uh, things there, guidelines and forms that help guide the congregation in the worship service. And it's typically pretty detailed. Well, forms of, of service also apply to the, to the uh, Lord's Supper. So they developed, they developed a whole ritual type of form for that. Now without being, I'm not, I'm not criticizing anyone in their observances, I'm just saying that it seems a little bit far-fetched from what Jesus did in a very simple way by using two elements with his closest people, his associates, for the, to give the new covenant in his blood and to introduce it in the way he did it. Uh, and, and then to have man step in and say, well, we can do it so much better. Uh, sacraments, uh, this is an interesting thing. Sacraments uh, can be mysteries, I suppose. They can be things that are really not totally understood, but they are features of certain Protestant churches, notably to baptism and the uh, Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, uh, as they refer to the uh, Lord's Supper, uh, as the two Protestant sacraments typically, I'm just saying typically those are the two. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church churches have seven sacraments. Uh, so when, when you hear about those, you know, I've got them here, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, matrimony, penance, holy orders, and extreme unction. What that reminds me of is the way the Jewish leadership and hierarchy began to uh, bind extra duties and regulations upon the Jews. Uh, it wasn't enough to have just a one thing in a simple way, but they had to do this additional, put additional burdens on. And I'm wondering here if this is not sort of the same thing that has happened with respect to something as simple, what seems to be as simple as uh, the Lord's Supper that Jesus himself instituted. So what it gets back to, I guess, in, in the and from our way of thinking about this in terms of from our church perspective, what did Jesus want to happen? He introduced it. He wanted people to remember the events. He, he used something that was very common to the people, the bread and the wine. They were very familiar with the bread and wine being used in the Passover. Uh, they were very, there was nothing, nothing unfamiliar to them about that, and these things were readily available to them, so it was very simple and easy for them to obtain these. And he wanted to have them look at these, see these things visibly. The idea of focusing upon on those things and, and remembering what he said, this is my body, talking about the bread. It wasn't his body, but they knew exactly what he meant. It represented his body. 
and the, and the wine, the cup, represented his blood, the blood of the new covenant. So when we think of it that way, it seems, why go farther afield with something that he wanted in that, in that way to be completely understood, something they could do over and over, something that was available to them so they could do it and observe it every week. He, you know, someone, some have said, and study Bibles will say this, there's no strict uh, commandment that it is to be observed weekly. And you may have that in your Bible. Even your study Bible may say that exact thing. Um, uh, notice what, what to Paul related. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup. Well, what a lot of people say, well, well that just means that it's not necessarily absolutely required to be weekly. So what has happened with us? Why do we say it could be, it should be weekly? And we really come back to uh, the scripture in Acts, Acts 20, verse 7. And then I think we also see in Acts 2.42 that the early church, the early Christians eagerly wanted to observe this. They made a point to do it. They were intent upon doing it, and they made it a big part, a big central part of their coming together when they did come together to worship. That's, our, that's what we look at. That's what our example is. And if you think about it, it does help us. It really doesn't become a rote exercise, something we take for granted and pass over lightly if you really think about it. We really gain a lot from that weekly observance. It's a reconnection to the body and the blood. It's a reconnection to Jesus' sacrifice. It's a continuation of that covenant relationship. It's a weekly reminder. So I think that's, that's a really significant thing. I've talked all I can. Any, any questions by anybody? Yes, sir. Jim. We've got our focus in a different place. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, what would you do after you pass? Well, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. For those online, Jim's point, I think the main point is that the disciples came together, the early Christians came together for the purpose of breaking bread. I know you had a comment back, Lynette, and we... Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, her uh, her point is that the first day of the week is a very has a very clear meaning. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight. We appreciate all of you and uh, those online, and we wish and we wish Dave the very best on this trip. <laughs> I'm still trying to get over that 26 hour one way deal. Thanks everybody. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, Willie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. That's good. Yes. <laughs> that is. Yeah. That is. But you know, you're right. I think uh, I'm it's kind obvious. I'm kind of hearing that the Christians didn't continue existing just yeah. because some man wrote a book I know, and I know, said. I know. So it's, why are we even studying this? It's, it's very interesting to me that uh, it's pretty well documented that the uh, the Catholic, you know, what, what happened to the Catholic, just, this one book I read, the, the guy says, okay, after the apostles died, the only people left that we can visibly know or sort of read about, Timothy and Titus, we know that they were there, and they were authenticated by Paul and all that. But beyond them, there, there probably were some others we don't know about, but the people who were after the apostles didn't have the same clout. And the apostles had covered as far as we know. As far as we know. And so the man then picks up and begins to fill in and say, okay, let's get this thing organized. But there's no proof of that either. Well, there's a, there's a, the one thing that happens is, and Rome you've, you've probably heard this, Rome was so potent that what they did is they said, okay, um, we are going to organize this religious group, this religion on the basis of like the empire. Yes, but you know. Yeah. So, I just think, because I think, we don't maybe have the document, it could we, be buried in the bottom of the Vatican. Probably. Yeah, yeah. We, so, we, don't, we, we don't have the answers. We don't have all the answers. But all we know is, thank goodness, thank God, the, uh, the word, the word was preserved so that people could look at it, determine themselves. So, what difference is all that? Yeah. It should 